Hmm. Hi everyone, it's me. And today we are learning about the humans in The Walking Dead together. Oh, the world we know is gone. Mm -hmm. But keeping our humanity? That's a choice. Oh, is it Dale? I beg to differ. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory. Hey. The most brain-dead show on all the internet. And wouldn't you know it, The Walking Dead is back. Now, I love talking about zombies in The Walking Dead. Where to survive, what weapons to use, zombie decomposition. That's gonna leave a mark. But one thing that I love about The Walking Dead is that it does perhaps the best job of exploring the mental toll and physical realities of what it would be like to live in this fighter-filled world day after day. Well, realities all except for the deafness of the survivors. Yeah, Bobby Kirks, I'm not letting that one die. Oh yeah, and the fact that the bloodborne insects would transmit the disease. You guys really work hard to find out like scientific reasons for all this stuff and then <laughs> And then, matter of fact, it looks so young. Oh my gosh. And I go, I don't know, mosquitoes? Nah, too hard. Great. Truth hurts. That's Robert Kirkman, by the way, the creator himself, who I got to interview and grill about some of the fan community's theories about the show. He confirmed... Who have you been most sad to see die off in the show? But Tyrese, definitely Tyrese. And denied... <sighs> Has Rick been in a coma this whole time? No. Some huge things about the show, including some of my own theories, but I'll save more on... Okay, pointing a, a sword in front of someone, bad idea. Genuinely bad idea. Just don't take out your swords out of your sheath. I'm sorry, your, your sheath at any time. Alright, if you really do it, it's gonna be bad. Bad until the end of this episode. Because first, I want to focus on another realization that hit me as I watched Negan bash out someone's eye with a barbed wire bat. The sheer density of just awful, awful, depraved, sick human beings Rick and the group encounter on a regular basis. Remember, these guys are taking a few hikes through the American South in the span of less than two years. According to online sources, the end of season five was only about 514 days after the initial outbreak. But in that year and a half, they've run into murderous dictators, flesh-eating cannibals, and more roadside criminals than you can shake a Lucille at. Now, at first, I thought this was just for storytelling purposes. You know, we need to have drama in a story, so let's sprinkle in a fresh helping of ruthless maniacs every so often to see how the group responds. But then I stopped and realized something, that if the events of The Walking Dead happened in real life, you'd see the exact same thing happen. Um, I beg to defer. I have to defer. All right. Uh, maybe it's different in, maybe it's similar in different part of the world, but I still believe a huge part of the world where humanity will prove We want to stay together. I still believe that. And all in all, humanity, everybody, everyone still have their own Involved. This isn't a fictional system built on false stakes. An apocalypse like this actually gives a survival advantage to certain personality types, specifically psychopaths. And the demands of a zombie apocalypse in particular means that you'd start to develop a significantly higher proportion of sociopaths in the surviving population. So what exactly does that mean and how does it affect Rick and the Pips? Well, prepare yourself for one eye-popping conclusion. First, we need to define our terms because even in researching for this episode- Evil the purview. Good guys do nothing. Good men do nothing. Good people do nothing. I was literally pulling my hair out trying to get it all straight because no one standard of definition really exists. So more often than not, the word psychopathy is referring to a mental disorder that causes a person to not feel guilt. Psychopaths tend to be unfeeling and have a difficult time connecting with the emotions of others. They're arrogant and manipulative and tend to be huge risk takers. Sociopathy, from all my reading, is basically the same thing but with one small difference. In general usage, psychopaths are born while sociopaths are bred. 
dead. Nature versus nurture. Severe trauma or some sort of abuse are the most likely culprits of creating a sociopath, someone with disaffected emotion and great skill in manipulation. However, it's worth noting that both fall under the category of antisocial personality disorder or ASPD. So, got all that? Well, even if you don't, I think this quote from someone who is actually suffering from ASPD will clear it up for you. Quote, I have almost no ability to empathize with others, and even at the death of those close to me, I did not feel sorrow. Instead, I knew that I should be feeling sorrow, and so I exhibited the emotions that I knew I should be feeling. This was the training and treatment that I received. Why not put you in different environment? Make it surround yourself with people that are happy. If a society, if you are located in a society in which you are, you are uncomfortable with, if you are located in a society in which you are feeling sad, and it's to the point in which life and death hang to the balance, change your surroundings, change your environment. Heck, take a, take a passport, fly to another country. So clearly, we're talking about individuals who have a hard time reading the emotions of others while also not really caring about those emotions or those people much in the first place. Now, part of the reason we all love zombie fiction so much is that we assume it's our chance to be a badass. Look at me getting to wield crowbars and shotguns and spiked bats, looting homes and having all sorts of creative kills. Boom! Headshots! Except there's that operative word of... Kill. Something most of us overlook is that zombies still look very human, and psychologically speaking, we're programmed not to kill each other. And that's not even mentioning having to kill loved ones who are just bitten. We see this situation played out time and time again in The Walking Dead. Daryl is forced to kill Dale. Morgan must kill his wife. Carl steps up to be the one to put his mother out of her misery. So as you can imagine, being able to separate yourself emotionally from other humans is gonna be super helpful when your very survival is dependent on you stabbing humans looking figures through the brain all the time, i.e. the trait that literally defines antisocial personality disorder. And that's- Even if you have to do it, you need to do it, right? Reason yourself. For better cause. For better improvement. Something The Walking Dead nails. Time and time again yes, throughout the series, we see men who could be diagnosed with some form of ASPD in positions of power. Negan, the head of the saviors, who manipulates people with his charm, uses fear to keep people in line, and makes killing into a game. From issue 114 of the comic, quote, Negan rules by fear or by manipulating people into thinking he's the only thing keeping them alive. They worship him. For him, it's all about ego. All signs of a sociopath through and through. Then there's Joe, the leader of the claimers. Why well, heard yourself when you can hurt other people. Seems to me like things are finally starting to fall together. And then really finds his place during the apocalypse. And of course you can't forget the governor, a smooth talking manipulator. You're not prisoners here, you're guests. But if you want to leave, as I said, you're free to do so. Who rules with an iron fist, killing anyone who threatens him without hesitation, including his own men. Keep poking the bear and you're bound to get more. Then there are the people who were changed by the apocalypse. Not changed in the sense that they became a zombie, but rather the traumas of the apocalypse changed them into sociopaths. And perhaps no one exemplifies this better than Gareth, head of Terminus, a group of literal cannibals. Terminus started as a community to help others who needed it in the aftermath of the zombies. But when a violent road gang took advantage of their goodwill and started killing them, imprisoning them, and raping them, he changed from this... You were trying to do something good. ...to this... You're the butcher, or you're the cattle. Becoming murderous, becoming distrustful, and manipulating others only to betray them, turning into a sociopath was a survival advantage for him and his crew. So as we see with Gareth, you would think that communities who don't have ASPD, the ones who look for peaceful solutions and work toward community-minded goals, people like Rick and the Grimes would get swallowed up by these characters, are doomed. If you're not willing to pull the trigger first, the sociopath is gonna do it for you. We can all live together. There's enough room for all of us. Kill them all! <laughs> So is that it? Do the sociopaths slowly weed out everyone else in the zombie apocalypse until it's just a world of Negans and governors? Well, not according to the show, and not according to science. The sociopathic leaders and ruthless criminals that we run into throughout the series all seem to get themselves picked off one way or the other by the prolific yeah. Grimes gang. Sure, it isn't yeah. always easy, but Rick's rangers always make it while these supposedly perfect survival machines end up taking a biter to the face. But why? Well, it turns out that this post-apocalypse is just another round of 
good old-fashioned Darwinian survival of the fittest. And here's what I mean. Darwinian evolution was first based on individual evolution. The best individuals survive, fish grows feet, beaks get optimized, all that jazz. But over time, evolutionary biologists have found that that's not actually the whole story. It's more towards stronger together. Enter group survival theory and multi-level selection theory. Two mm. <laughs> evolutions of Darwin's original ideas. These are both <laughs> really complicated and go into a lot of genetics and cell biology, but at their core, the theories look to explain why animals in the same species cooperate with each other. Shouldn't every Dalmatian be trying to compete with all the other Dalmatians for Dalmatian DNA domination? Try saying that one five times fast. In Dalmatian DNA domination. In reality, it's not what you see. Instead, you see animals working working together in groups True. and packs and using altruism to promote the survival of the species as a whole. Well, it turns out that when you take away the basic necessities for human survival, like toilet paper and iPhones, we're still just a species trying to survive together and not together. get eaten alive or go deaf by shooting guns too close to our ears. And we function by the same rules as other species, especially when it comes to group survival and multi-level selection theory. Group survival multi-level selection theory. Humans in a cooperative group survive better than lone wolves, as long sure. as the groups are genuinely cooperative like Rick's. As long as the group is genuinely very cooperative, the key is that the benefits of a group need to outweigh the benefits of going it alone, and in The Walking Dead, loners don't last. So when the show spends all that time slow grinding through group dynamics, it's not just so that we can see Daryl and Carol have yet another stunted heart-to-heart -heart in the moonlight, it's because that's the stuff that's actually keeping every one of those characters alive. So where does that leave our villains? Well, like I said, group survival theory only works when members cooperate, and when there's genuine altruism. Know who does doesn't do altruism? Unchecked sociopaths, unchecked psychopaths, people with ASPD, they do narcissism, a pathological they just mention Mario. Logical overconfidence in their own abilities that drives them away from group survival theory. Forget about helping others, that requires empathy and concern for people's survival. Something that sociopaths not only don't feel, but biologically cannot feel. Personally, I can't stand the character of Carl, but he has one amazing quote in issue 125 of the comics that summarizes all of this perfectly. Quote, Someone is gonna tell you to get used to this, that feeling of being scared and sad. Don't listen. Don't listen to them. Correct. Hold on to it. Remember it. Don't let yourself forget it. It's too easy to lose. It's too easy to lose. It's way harder to find it back. His advice is more practical than it seems. Becoming numb to fear and anxiety about losing people isn't just a matter of convenience, it's a matter of survival. Fear drives people toward group survival theory, and without being able to feel fear, you're no longer the best equipped to survive. The egoism the sociopaths in the series have in spades still can't make up for the fact that you can't function in a group in the long term. If you need a perfect example of it, take a look at the governor's storyline in the comics, which looks a little bit different than it does in the TV show. In the comics, it's not Michonne who ultimately kills him, it's his own army, who eventually refuses to kill more innocent people on his orders. But it also does hold true in the AMC series. In the TV show, before Michonne kills the governor, he has to survive another attempt on his life from Merle, a member of his supposed survival group who turns on him only to side with his brother. So in the end, even though it seems like sociopaths would be the best fit for survival in The Walking Dead, their lack of empathy and inability to participate in group survival ultimately spells their downfall every time. Contrary to what the critics say, The Walking Dead does have a message of hope, even if it is buried under main characters who get their eyes beaten out, or their jugulars torn from their throats, or old lovable doctors who lose their legs and eventually their heads. I guess in the end, I gotta hand it to Robert Kirkman. In the interview, I asked him about this theory, having not done the research yet. I was assuming that it would end that sociopaths have the best chance of survival in the apocalypse. He told me this. Uh, you know, Walking Dead is very much about how much we care for our family and loved ones and how we struggle to, you know, take care of them, protect them, how it affects us when, you know, something bad happens to them. And I think it's that, uh, you know, the humanity of that and the core aspect of Walking Dead is, is universal. And speaking of that interview, I'm gonna leave you now with that, because it's filled with a bunch of theory talk that I think you're gonna really enjoy. So in the meantime, guys, remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. Actually, more accurately, a bunch of TV theories. Jesus. And here's that interview. Has Rick been in a coma this whole time? No. no. You heard it here! That'd be the Stop worst. with the coma. That'd be the absolute worst thing ever. Like. 
Come on, Jerry. If it seems like it's gonna be the absolute worst thing ever, then it's not true. That seems like a sound theory, but it would be terrible. We should shoot that scene just to mess with people. Though. One of the things that we <laughs> notice across the, the Walking Dead TV show is that the zombies have seemed to become more and more decayed or decomposed as the seasons have gone on. Because we calculated it. What did you guys calculate? Because they're on the surface, uh -huh. exposed to the elements, and because of the extreme heat of the, the American South, they yes, sunlight. would be fully decayed by about two months in. Yeah, I mean, that's something that Greg Nicotero uh, and his team at KMB, they sit down every, between every season and try and figure out, like, you know, what's the new advancement that we can do with a zombie? What's the way that we can make them look a little different? And the idea there is that, you know, time is going on. And So is there a period of time that you've kind of had in your head where that first mega wave of zombies that we see in kind of season yeah, yeah, one yeah. dies out or passes on or kind of returns to the dust? Yeah, like 16 seasons or so. I don't oh, yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, when the audience starts to yeah, yeah, uh, move yeah. away from the show. <laughs> Who have you been most sad to see you know, die off in the show. It's hard to play favorites, you know, just because I do like them all, but Tyrese, definitely Tyrese. It's hard with the show because they're also connected to actors and yeah, it's like, I miss all of the of actors. Course. You know, you go to press events and they're not there and all of a sudden you're like, wait, where's Steven Young? Why isn't Steven here? Did he not come to this one? Oh, oh he does. Uh, that was a mistake. I really liked hanging out with that guy. <laughs> but uh, it's gotten to a point where I'm the guy on the show that's like, mm -hmm. hey, wouldn't it be weird if we did a season where we don't kill anybody? It would be a shock. It would that, be a yeah, shock it's like, that's how you shock people yeah, now. You true. don't kill people. Can we just not kill people? Right. And then there's always like, well, or there's this story that needs this. Yeah. But it's wearing me down is what I'm saying. I I'm, get it. too much death. Killing people is too emotionally much. taxing is what you're I, talking I know. About. It's the worst. Which I don't know how the serial killers do it. Uh, speaking of Tyrese, oh. as the theory guy. Oh, tell me more. There's an, a lot of online theories that there are hidden secrets as to the end of the series in kind of his death sequence or kind of the, the death hallucination that uh -huh. he's having in his final moments. Any huh. any truth or... Huh. I'm not gonna deny anything. Like yeah. 16 something. years down I don't road. know if it necessarily points to the end, but you know, things are pointing Maybe to Maybe some future events. Sure, sure. You gotta settle the age-old debate. Yes. Who would I win in a fight? I love settling debates. Okay. Who would win in a fight? Not me. Okay, done. No, well, that, that, then <laughs> that's the question. It's you heard it here first, not Robert. Who no. was it against, just to be <laughs> sure? The debate was uh, Carl versus Michonne versus Daryl. I know, the choice is obvious to me. Jeez. All three at the same time? Yeah. I feel like that would be... Battle Royale. You know, they're going to have trouble hurting Carl, and Carl's going to win, not because he's the better fighter, right. but just because the other two are going to be at a disadvantage because of their humanity, and they're going to underestimate the kid. But, you know, oh. look straight out uh, physical uh, ability, and i, I got to give it to Michonne. Daryl has cried more in the show, like, way more than Michonne has. <laughs> way more. But he has a ranged weapon. So ranged weapon. Whatever. What? It, he it, shoots one off, it, 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 she takes it in the shoulder, he's reloading, she cuts his head off. I think a lot of people who are aspiring creators, especially who watch this show, would love to kind of know what it's like when you've quote unquote made it. You know, uh -huh. did you ever expect to get here? And it's tough. what is it? All right, um, so let me just listen to this very closely. No. It's real tough. No, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the neuroses, those never go away. I'm still insecure. I still hate everything that I do. I still I still try to make everything better than, than I possibly can, and I'm always disappointed when I don't reach that level. All that creative torment that, that I felt in the beginning, yeah. totally still present. Has it increased now that it's achieved such a level of immense popularity that, oh, I'm going to let down the fans, or oh, I, I don't want to disappoint them, or yeah, do you yeah, kind yeah. of, like, as a sociopath, relish in those moments of, like, oh, man, they're going to love uh, me for this. If I start paying attention to that while I'm trying to write, I'm never going to get anything done. You know, anytime I sit down to work, I'm trying to make it good. If I try to add an extra level of pressure because it's going to be seen by more people, uh, I think I feel like it's just going to make the work bad. As a it's a fine line to cross. It's like a knife edge. Creative person, if you're out there trying to worry about whether or not uh, the thing you're doing is going to be successful or if it's going to be received by an audience, uh, you're kind of kneecapping yourself because what you really should be focused on is, you know, does it speak to you? And also eat your vegetables. And with that, we ah. conclude therapy with Robert. Thank you. <laughs> Great Thank time. Thank you so much. Awesome. Great time. <laughs> Lots of fun. Thank you for proving that he's not in a coma. Oh, Definitely okay. not in a coma. Literally the worst. It's terrible. It's so bad. That's interesting. All right. Thank you so much for watching this video with together with me. If you do like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have anything to share with us. Don't forget to follow my channel and sincerely appreciate all the support for my uh, channel and my videos as well. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in my next video. Um, on the quick side notes, I hope that you find this video very thoughtful, knowledgeable, educational, and I genuinely hope that you learn something new today. Make the world a better place, please. <laughs>
have a heart, do your part, be a good human being for society, for everyone. But hey, that's just a theory, a film theory, and cut. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye bye. And don't forget to subscribe. Hope to see you in my next video. Bye bye.